they don't make too much noise. I can throw them. Um, I, I love hearing Walter say that uh, we had a youth band up the front this morning. And I know it's a sign of your age when people in their 20s are considered youth. So I think, Walter, maybe it's your age that's kind of a bit different there. Um, young adults. But yes, it was a pleasure to have you guys here. And uh, I think we can all say we're always um, glad for you to come back any time at all. Uh, we love having you around. Um, weddings. I love weddings, and this is my favourite passage to do at weddings when I do weddings. Weddings are a great affair, but they're different throughout the world. So wherever you go, they're kind of performed very differently. In actual fact, out of all the weddings I've performed, I think I've only performed two inside churches. Uh, part of that is because most of the weddings I've performed are in Australia, and uh, most of the time people want to have them outdoors on a beach, uh, in a beautiful park setting or something like that. Um, and God is wherever the wedding is taking place, he's there amongst us. And the only two that I've done actually in churches have been family members, have been uh, nieces and nephews of mine that I've, been the, uh, I've had the joy in being the person who married them. So weddings are different and they're different affairs wherever you go. And if you go back to this era, you've got to understand that these weddings were a bit different too. Um, they would take place on a Wednesday if the bride was a virgin, and if she was a widow, they would start on the Thursday, and they would go for about five days. It wasn't over in a couple of hours or 20 minutes or a quick signing at the registry. It would go for a period of time. So when we're talking about jars that held 20 to 30 gallons, you can understand why they needed so much there. And it was also probably most likely that the whole town was invited to the wedding. And as the whole town is invited to the wedding, you've got to supply a lot of stuff. And in a shame culture, where if you ran out of stuff, you could actually be sued by people who were disappointed by what was provided for them. So they were likely, possibly, able to be sued for running out of wine for this wedding by someone who felt that as an affront to their sensibilities. So this was a big deal. This wasn't just a fun event where people had had too much to drink and they drank too much of the wine and it was all gone. There's a little bit more behind this. But I want to talk to m about Mary for a little bit, because I think Mary's what, the most important character in this story. And I know a lot of people have a problem with that, but let's talk a little bit more about that, and maybe you won't, you won't have so much of a problem with her at the end of it. You've got a, one of my favourite songs at Christmas time is a song that's uh, performed by many people, it's called Mary Did You Know. It's a beautiful song and it goes into all the things that Jesus did and how could Mary have known that, that he did all these wonderful things. But actually, I think the answer to that simple question is yes. I think Mary knew very well who Jesus was. She accepted the responsibility of bringing her Lord and Saviour into the world and being his mother very seriously. You've got to ask yourself, what did he do as a child that gave her the indications of these things along the way? We only have one story about Jesus' childhood where he is supposedly lost, but he wasn't really lost. He was exactly where he wanted to be. He was in the temple talking to the priests. That's the only story about Jesus as a child that we know of. It's the only one we hear about. And some people don't like Mary too much. They see giving Mary a, a bit of respect as too Catholic. And there are people who actually treat Mary with contempt, which is a bit of a shame, I think. Because we need to pause here and remember that she is the mother of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. I don't think you can say to Jesus, I love you, but I don't like your mother very much. Because if you said to me, I like you, but I don't like your mother very much, I would be offended and I would stand up for my mother and stand up on her behalf. I don't think you can say that. If it wasn't for Mary, we might not have this story. Jesus is at a wedding, quite possibly there as Mary's plus one. He could have been there because he was invited because Mary was involved. Mary seemed to be quite involved in the whole wedding process. She's the one who's realised they've run out of wine. Was she actually part of the catering team for this wedding in a town for people that she knew? Were these family members for Jesus and the disciples to all be invited along? It wasn't an accident. So Mary is a pretty important character. And if it wasn't for her, we might not have this story. It's Mary who says to Jesus, they have no more wine. Just a simple statement. But, she knew, but Jesus knew exactly what she was getting at. Just like any mother who says to their child, your room's looking a bit dirty. You know that she's saying, it's an about time you cleaned the room up. She's saying, they have no more wine. And Jesus going, what's it got to do with me, mum? Now, 
Some people see this dear woman as some kind of an affront to Mary, but it's actually done in a more loving way than that. The, the word for it is a, a much more uh, um, friendly and passionate term than what we would say, dear woman, don't do that kind of thing. That's not what he's saying. He's saying it in a paternalistic and a loving way. And he's saying, mum, this is not my time yet. What are you talking about? Now, as I said, the family putting on this feast could have gotten into all sorts of trouble for running out of wine. They might have even been sued. But the question I want, I, that I ask, and this is how my brain works, is what did Jesus do as a child that gave Mary the impression that he could do something about this situation? We don't know when Joseph exited the scene in the family at all. We know he was still there when Jesus was about 12 when he was in the temple because he was part of the party looking for him. But after that, we don't know when Joseph left. So if Jesus was a carpenter and he'd learnt from his earthly father his trade, then he must have supported the family being the oldest boy. So he supported the family. He made sure there was food on the table. His mother, who was a widow, who would have needed to have been looked after by the oldest son, he always made sure that there was enough there. What did Mary know that we don't know? I'd love to have some of those stories. I can't wait to ask her some questions about Jesus as a child and what he got up to. I think that'd be awesome to hear some of those things. So what did she know that she knew that he could do something about this situation? I mean, he, this is the very first miracle that he does, as Job points out to us. So he hasn't done the, the fishes to loaves thing yet. He hasn't performed any of his other miracles. In John's gospel, this is the first miracle that Jesus performs. And if it wasn't for John's gospel, we wouldn't even have this story because it only appears in John's gospel. Jesus didn't want to do anything about it. In verse 4, he says, my time has not yet come. This is, it's not Jesus came prepared to turn water into wine and he knew this was going to happen and away he goes and he, was, he had his, all right, this is the first, I've got my list of miracles that I'm going to do to make sure that everybody knows what I'm about and the first one's going to be to turn water into wine at Cana. I don't think that was the case. I don't think he came prepared there to turn water into wine, but he listened to his mother. Jesus didn't want to do anything about it, but like a good boy, he steps in because his mother asked. Now, Jesus does something amazing here. He, yes, he performs, performs a miracle, but this is his first, and he only does it because his mother asks him to. Now, we can all agree that getting drunk is a bad idea, okay? No, no answer, no, no question there. The Bible says you shouldn't get drunk, all those kind of things. We agree with that. Now, some Christians, like my tribe, the Baptists, go quite a bit further with that and say that you shouldn't drink at all. You know, I come from a very strict Baptist background where you don't drink and you don't dance and you don't listen to rock music and all that kind of stuff. That was my upbringing as a Baptist. So you certainly didn't even look at alcohol, let alone drink any, um, unless, of course, your parents happened to be from Germany and then that was a whole different story again. <laughs> so some of these people, so like my, you know, tribe, go too far in their anti-alcohol stance and they try and make their belief into a theology and even try and say that, well, Jesus never drank alcohol, so therefore we shouldn't drink alcohol either. Um, and then they're just making their theology fit into the Bible rather than taking the Bible and making their theology from that because it's quite clear that Jesus turned water into wine, not grape juice. And how would he know what was good wine if he'd never drunk it before to be able to make good wine out of the water? Because not only does he make good wine, he makes the best wine, the master of ceremony says. And in the Lord's Supper, that's not grape juice in the cup. That's wine that they're sharing around the Passover table. So they take that a bit too far. But we can all agree getting drunk's a bad thing. I'm not saying go out there and get drunk. I'm not saying that at all. But to have a belief like that, you have to completely ignore this passage. And if we look closer, we see what he was doing. Now, the people at the wedding have drank so much that it should be difficult for them to tell the difference between good wine and bad wine. So... Let that sink in for a moment. They're partying and they're drinking, and I don't think they're too concerned about whether they're getting drunk or not. And they've drank so much that they can't tell the difference between good wine and bad wine. That's clear from this passage. Because the better wine is usually served first, and then when you're so drunk that you don't know any better, they feed you the rubbish stuff so that you can then just drink and you don't know what's going on. Think about this for a moment. Jesus gives people who have had enough to drink more alcohol. Good Christians wouldn't do that, would we? We would say, how about we turn the water into some black coffee or something, you know? But not give them more alcohol. 
God wouldn't do something like that, would he? Now, these are all interesting ideas and thoughts, that the kind of things that buzz through my head when I read Bible passages and I ask all these questions. But we have to start asking, well, why is this important? What's the purpose that John wrote this down for us for? Why did he think this was necessary for us to have in the Gospel of John, right at the start of Jesus' ministry? There are so many fa facets of truth to touch on here. And the, the Wednesday night Bible study group is going through a series at the moment on uh, reading the Bible like a Hebrew from Shane Willard. And he loves to talk about the Word of God being like a faceted diamond that has so many different facets that no matter which facet you look through, the colours are different and it looks different no matter which facet you look through. And it's no different here. There isn't any one singular message in this passage that you can pull out. The question is, what is this passage saying to me today? because there's so many different facets that we can touch on. We can talk about the transformation. It's not about just water and wine or even drunkenness. Jesus takes the failure of the wedding family. He takes their shame and transforms it into a celebration with the best wine, not just with average stuff. When I do a wedding ceremony, I do this passage and I talk about the fact that if you invite Jesus not only to your wedding but to your marriage he doesn't just give you ordinary wine he gives you the best wine so include Jesus in your marriage not just your wedding and that's the basics that I pull out that's the facet that I look at when I do a wedding but we're not at a wedding today for John all of these miracles are moments when heaven is opened when the transforming power of God's love bursts into the present world Every time Jesus performs a miracle, the transforming love of heaven bursts into our world. And they seem to happen wherever Jesus is, don't they? Whenever Jesus is present, that's when the miracles happen. When the Holy Spirit is present after Jesus returns to glory, that's when the miracles happen. Miracles are where heaven and earth intersect where heaven spills through and gets close enough to us that we can actually grasp some of the miraculous that is going to be in heaven one day. The wedding feast here, another facet, is also the appetizer to what John will write later in Revelation 21, when he talks about the bride coming down. The new Jerusalem appear, appears like a bride at a wedding. Is he pointing us towards that. At the very start of this passage, on the third day, is there something on the third day that we should be reading into in this passage? I don't think John wrote things for the sake of it. There was a reason behind every word he wrote. The jars of water hanging around are another facet. Why are all these big jars of water hanging around? They're at a wedding, people are drinking wine. Well, if you look at the Jewish culture, they would have had to have gone through Jewish purification rites before they sat down to this meal. So Jesus takes a Jewish practice and turns it into something else. Jesus says, I am the new purification rite. You don't need to do this anymore. And he takes that water and turns it into wine because this is a celebration, because the Messiah is here in your presence. When we are in shame because of our sin, or when we find ourselves in a dire situation we've got no control over, we would do really well to listen to the wisest person in the room. And who was that? Mary. With those simple words she says to the servants, do what he tells you. Simple, simple words. Did the attendants have any idea what was going on when they filled the jars full of water? They thought, oh, something good's going to happen here. They're going, what? Why would I fill the little jars full of water? They've used that water for purification rites already. What, why, are we not going to purify things again? They might have grumbled as they did it, thinking, I've got to go through this again. It's not a matter of turning on a tap and running a hose into some containers. They would have to fill containers from a well, bring them in, pour them into the containers, and do the you know, bucket by bucket thing to fill up all of these containers and get it done. Would have been a lot of work for the servants. They had no idea what was going on. They didn't know this was going to happen. But Mary says to them, do what he tells you. When we're in those situations, when we feel at the end of our rope, when there's nothing more we can do, unfortunately that tends to be 
the point where we then ask God for help. We wait until we're right at the very end of the rope. But when we're there, the best thing we can do is follow Mary's advice. Do what he tells you. Do what the Son of God tells you to do. She's the wisest person in the room at the time. And if it wasn't for Mary, we wouldn't have this story. When we do what the Son tells us to do, we listen to the Son through the Holy Spirit. And the Father provides the transformation for us. The Father provided the Son. Jesus was only there because the Father sent him. He was only doing this because the Father put him on this mission. Jesus will transform your pain into joy, your sorrow into celebration, your shame into glory. John later writes in the same gospel in John 10.10, 10, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life, or some versions say to live life to the full. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The things that you're going through, the pain and the terrible times that you're going through are all coming from the thief, not from Jesus. Jesus takes those painful moments and transforms them into something beautiful. But he doesn't give you those painful moments. They come from the thief. Because he comes to, to steal, kill, and destroy, not Jesus. He doesn't say, I'm going to teach you all a lesson. Part of what we're learning on Wednesday nights is as well is that in the early church, they would do something as that they considered important when reading the Bible is that they would read it in the voice of the Messiah. Which means that you need to read the Bible in a way that you can understand Jesus saying it. And if you can read the Bible in a way where Jesus is telling you that you're evil and you're horrible and you're terrible and you're awful, then you, perhaps you're not reading it in the correct way. Because Jesus brings no more condemnation. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus came to give us a life and live it to the full. He even supplied wine at a wedding to people who were drunk. He came to let us live life to the full. Not to live a life of pain and sorrow and misery. There is pain and sorrow and misery in our lives, but Jesus transforms that into something good. Perhaps that is the role that we too are called to. to the, our purpose should be to give each other and others a rich and satisfying life. Is that the fruit of what we are as Christians? Is that what we're doing? Giving others a rich and satisfying life? Jesus transforms the mundane and normal into rich and satisfying. Jesus transforms our failures into victories. Jesus transforms us from sinners to saints. You know that? We are all saints in Christ Jesus. We are all saints in Christ Jesus. We need to give Mary the respect she deserves and we need to follow her example. Do whatever Jesus tells you. Then we might just see for ourselves that even in our own life, heaven and earth intersect. Listen to the words of Jesus. Listen to what he has to say to us. And there's going to be a, a, a really hard way of finding that out because sometimes you've got to switch everything off and actually pay attention to what he has to say to you. Sometimes he says it to you through his word, through the Bible, and we need to read it regularly. I know it sounds like a chore, but it's life-giving and it's beautiful and it's something that we should do on a regular basis. Everyone should be reading their Bibles regularly, memorising scripture. Uh, it, you might have a shocking memory like mine, but it's so important to memorise scripture because there are times when those attacks come when you don't know how to handle it and there's just a scripture in your head that you recite over and over and over again to help you to get through that time because you don't always have your Bible to hand to try and find it. Memorising scripture is really important. Reading your Bible is really important. That's what meaning disciples is, is part of that comes from discipline in learning to do these things on a regular basis. And that's how we listen to God. We turn everything off and meditate on him. People sometimes loathe sitting and doing nothing. If you're sitting and focusing your attention on Jesus, you're not doing nothing. 
You're doing something extremely important. You're blocking out all of the negativity and noise and notifications and beeps and dings and things that pop up on our electronic devices. They have an off button. Turn it off, put it away for an hour and sit there and listen to God. You don't need to check your emails 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can put it away and spend some time and listen to God. Do whatever Jesus tells you because that's where heaven and earth intersect. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together here this morning. Not everybody in this world is as lucky as us to be able to come and share with one another about the love of your son. Father, we thank you for choosing Mary to be your faithful servant. And we thank you for the effort that she poured in to bringing up our Lord and Saviour. Lord, we know that she is uh, no more worthy than any one of us here, but she is certainly worthy enough to be your Lord, see the Lord's mother, and we give her that respect. Lord, we pray to you, and we ask that you open our hearts and show us what it is that you are saying to us. Tell us what to do, whether it's which job we should take, which person we should help, which holiday destination we should go on, which person to share our faith with, Tell us what to do. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you are with us day by day to help us to listen to those instructions, to take them into our hearts so that we can live life to the full and help those around us to live their life to the full. Help us to be your witnesses in these places that you've placed us, universities and homes and businesses and offices and factories, wherever you've placed us, Lord. We pray that you show us where it is that you want us to make our difference in our little corner of it. We pray these things in your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.